Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the country. My name is David Lamont Wilson, and I am the National Coordinator for National Prevention Week. And I first want to say happy National Prevention Week. Uh, we are a national public education platform showcasing the work of communities and organizations across the country dedicated to raising awareness about the importance of substance misuse prevention and positive mental health. So I am super excited about the week that we have planned for you. And I am super excited about today's kickoff. And I have the honor and the privilege of introducing our first speaker, uh, who happens to be my boss. Uh, so I am pleased to introduce Captain Jennifer Fan, who is the acting director of SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention since November 2022. Jen is a commissioned officer in the U.S. Public Health Service, and Captain Fan has been a member of the SAMHSA family since 2007, serving in several roles as a leader and a subject matter expert, including the acting CSAP deputy director. She's been the special assistant for the CSAP director, the Office of National Drug Control Policy Liaison for the Drug-Free Community Support Program. She's been a subject matter expert on opioids and prescription drug misuse. And she has been a public health advisor pharmacist for SAMHSA's legislative and regulatory affairs. And before, she came to SAMHSA. Captain Fan worked at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in the Office of Medical Policy and the Office of Generic Drugs. She also worked at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the Division of Ambulatory Services on Medicaid Part B reimbursement. So she brings to us not only her leadership skills, but a wealth of experience. And so I am so proud. And I hope you join me in welcoming Captain Jennifer Fan. Thanks, David. Um, uh, great introduction. Um, I am humbled to, to be back at, at SAMHSA. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, as David said, I'm Captain Jennifer Fan, uh, Acting Director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at SAMHSA. And I am thrilled to officially kick off National Prevention Week 2023. Today, we're marking an exciting new milestone for one of SAMHSA's most prolific and impactful youth substance use prevention campaigns, Talk They Hear You. Since 2013, Talk They Hear You has empowered parents and caregivers, educators, and community members to get informed, be prepared, and take action to prevent and reduce underage drinking and other substance use among young people. This event is part of a week-long celebration of the incredible work of the prevention community across the country, and we're going to hear today about a few of these success stories from three of SAMHSA's community partners. Talk They Hear You has reached families, schools, and communities in all corners of the country, most notably the campaign's television, radio, and print public service announcements have collectively garnered over more than 21.7 billion impressions. Talk They Hear You is grounded in evidence-based approaches that we know work. And the idea that our best defense is to prevent underage drinking and other substance use before it even starts. And parents and caregivers, educators and community members can play a critical role in early intervention. And did you know 70% of high school students will have tried alcohol by the time they are in their senior year. Half will have taken an illegal drug and more than 20% will have used a prescription drug for a non-medical purpose. But evidence suggests that their curiosity about alcohol and other drugs may come much earlier, as young as age nine. Children begin thinking alcohol may not just be for adults. The involvement of parents and other important adults in a child's life is one of the most powerful protective factors that decrease the likelihood of substance misuse among youth. They have a significant influence on youth's decisions about experimenting with alcohol and other drugs. 
Talk to Hear You is designed to give parents and caregivers, educators, and community members the tools to have effective conversations with youth about these issues and provides the reassurance that what they say matters today, tomorrow, and in the future. During this National Prevention Week, pledge to start and keep talking with kids about underage drinking and other drug use prevention, because when you talk, they do hear you. Now we're going to hear from Tom Coderre, our Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use. In his role as SAMHSA's Region 1 Administrator, Tom led the prioritization of prevention, treatment, and recovery services under the strain of COVID-19. He reconvened a federal interagency workgroup on opioids, and as overdoses spiked throughout 2020, he brought the region together to identify programmatic and policy solutions to respond. While Chief of Staff to the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use and Senior Advisor to the Administrator, Tom led the team that produced Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health. He also represented SAMHSA at the White House and other HHS offices and operating divisions, taking part in many cross-agency partnerships, such as the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council and the Interagency Coordinating Committee for the Prevention of Underage Drinking. Tom was also the senior advisor to the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and the federal liaison to Unite to Face Addiction, the first rally for addiction treatment, recovery, and policy change, which attracted tens of thousands to the National Mall and joined together 650 partner organizations, celebrities, policymakers, and healthcare experts. Tom is the first person in recovery to lead SAMHSA. His career has been significantly influenced by his personal journey and a philosophy that acknowledges the essential role peer recovery support services play in helping people with mental and substance use disorders rebuild their lives. And with that, I welcome Tom Coderre. Thank you so much, Captain Fan, uh, and good afternoon and welcome everyone to National Prevention Week 2023. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you today to kick off this important health observance. Uh, our Assistant Secretary, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, asked me to send her best wishes. She would have been here today, but uh, is in Alaska, actually, visiting some of our grantees. You know, during National Prevention Week, we come together as a community to focus on preventing substance misuse and promoting positive mental health. We know prevention plays a critical role in creating healthy and resilient communities. We know prevention works when we work together. And we know prevention works best when it can reach people where they live, work, play, and worship. Uh, our new National Prevention Week tagline, a celebration of the possibility, I'm sorry, of possibility, uh, a celebration of possibility is really about communities coming together to acknowledge the brighter futures that exist thanks to the ongoing work of prevention happening across the country. So how can we work together to change the prevention landscape? Well, during National Prevention Week, SAMHSA is providing your communities with evidence-based and accessible resources to facilitate collective action and storytelling. Together, we can showcase how prevention works for different populations in a variety of settings, thereby confronting the societal challenges surrounding substance misuse. Throughout the week, we have some exciting things in store. Today, National Prevention Week kicks off with the 10th anniversary relaunch of SAMHSA's Talk They Hear You campaign. Through this campaign, SAMHSA aims to prevent underage drinking and other substance use by providing parents and caregivers, educators and community members with information and resources to address these issues with our nation's youth. Join the 10th anniversary re relaunch event to hear from featured campaign partners and to find out about the newest suite of Talk They Hear You products. Then on Wednesday, you can join the community's talk to prevent alcohol and other drug misuse team for a prevention conversation that showcases and celebrates prevention success stories in four diverse communities. The conversation is gonna highlight successful prevention strategies, including prevention, uh, participation rather in National Prevention Week, along with stories, insights, and lessons learned. Since 2006, Communities Talk has provided prevention resources and planning stipends to thousands of community-based organizations, to colleges and universities, to develop tailored strategies for, for each of those communities, because we know that prevention works best, as I said, when it happens at the community level. 
So every day during National Prevention Week, we encourage you to share your My Prevention story on social media, whether it's your helping to prevent substance use, whether it's your personal experience in treatment or recovery. Jen mentioned uh, my recovery story and how I love to share it. I really believe there is power in our stories. Um, or if you want to share about ways you promote mental health, all of these things are going to help expand uh, people's experience with prevention, uh, help people understand prevention better, uh, and to really be part of this National Prevention Week celebration. So be part of the national storytelling movement that celebrates prevention uh, and use the hashtag, uh, my prevention story. My young friends told me that's hashtag, hashtag my prevention story. Uh, additionally, throughout the week, uh, you're going to have access to several on-demand resources we've created for audiences of all ages uh, to get involved and to learn more about prevention. So check out uh, the National Prevention Week virtual conference platform for videos, promotional materials, and a series of interactive uh, prevention activities, including, um, this is uh, some neat stuff, uh, a prevention crossword puzzle, a word search, uh, and a prevention fill-in-the-blank exercise uh, to help you create your uh, hashtag my prevention story. Prevention happens year-round, too. Um, of course, we, we want to highlight the ongoing efforts of uh, practitioner organizations, communities, and individuals during National Prevention Week, uh, but we also want to do it all year long. Whether starting a conversation with a friend or a loved one about the risks of substance misuse, supporting prevention efforts in your community, or seeking help for yourself or someone uh, you know who may be struggling with mental health or substance use issues, your actions, let me just assure you, your actions can and do make a difference in those folks' lives. So please join me in, up, in celebrating and uplifting our amazing prevention community. Uh, thank you to uh, our Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, to its director, Captain Fan, to our entire staff uh, who has worked really, really hard, to all of our contractors and community participants. Um, we look forward to continued partnerships where we're going to be able to share the knowledge and best practices with the field. Together, we really can celebrate the possibility of prevention and support a healthier future. Thanks for letting me be here with you today. And once again, uh, happy National Prevention Week. Thanks, Tom. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Robert Vincent. Rob serves as the Associate Administrator for Alcohol Prevention and Treatment Policy at SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. He is also the staff chair of the Interagency Coordinating Committee on the Prevention of Underage Drinking, which provides a national leadership in federal policy and programming to support state and community activities that prevent and reduce underage drinking. Prior to coming to SAMHSA, Rob served as the administrator for True North Student Assistance and Treatment Services at the Educational Service District 113's Department of Educational Support in Olympia, Washington. There, he was responsible for the development, implementation, and management of a 45 school district consortium addressing school safety and substance abuse prevention, intervention, and treatment programs. Rob served as the principal investigator of the Olympia Effective Adolescent Grant and as a consultant specializing in the implementation of school-based prevention and treatment programs for several states. Rob has worked in the area of substance abuse prevention, intervention, and treatment for more than 34 years as a nationally certified clinician and served as the director of counseling and assistance programs for the U.S. Navy during Desert Storm. And with that, I hand it over to Rob Vincent. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Tom and David. Um, and just welcome everybody to National Prevention Week. Hi, everybody. My name's Rob Vincent, and um, it's our we're finally here at our National Prevention Week. We're here to share with you today our 10th anniversary. Many of you know about National Prevention Week as a public education platform for substance use and mental health um, and how we've continued to do that. And during this year, we're going to launch an, our showcase and all of the work of our uh, prevention work across the country. We really are excited to be with you to celebrate our community partners who are doing such amazing prevention work every day as we celebrate this 10 years. And 
Talk to hear you as a national um, uh, youth substance use prevention campaign really um, uh, has provided parents and caregivers, educators, community members, tools and resources that to help them have important conversations with youth early and often to prevent underage drinking and other substance use. The campaign is led and guided by our Interagency Coordinating Committee for the Prevention of Underage Drinking, and that's 22 federal agencies that come together to do so. And it's managed and run by the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Let me now share with you a short video to learn a little bit more about our campaign. Did you know 140,000 people die from excessive alcohol use in the U.S. each year? That's enough people to fill a football stadium one and a half times. The younger someone starts drinking alcohol or using other drugs, the more likely they are to develop a substance use disorder as an adult. When it comes to supporting the health, wellness, and well-being of our nation's youth, we all play an important role. But what can you do? Start with small and frequent conversations to help prevent substance use. Since 2013, the Talk They Hear You campaign has been here to support your prevention efforts as parents and caregivers, educators, and community members. By helping you get informed, be prepared, and take action, the campaign promotes the importance of having and continuing these conversations and looking for signs that youth may need more support. You might be asking yourself, am I ready for these talks? Will they even listen? How will they react? No matter what role you play in a child's life, talking about these issues can help keep them safe and prepare them to make healthy decisions when it matters. So get informed by learning about the prevalence and consequences of underage substance use. Be prepared by practicing different skill building techniques and using helpful resources and tools. And take action by frequently talking with youth about the risks and dangers of substance use. And if they need more support, use the Talk They Hear You screening tool to better understand their needs and find helpful resources. Visit talktheyhearyou.samhsa.gov to learn more about the campaign and find resources that can help you influence kids' decisions about underage drinking and other drug use. Because when you talk, they hear you. And let me share with you a little bit about our agenda today. Um, we're gonna talk about the campaign through the years. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the key audiences and how we've morphed and grown and changed and shaped some things. And by the way, their input for us. We're going to talk a little bit about the products and how we've grown and evolved over the years um, as we've developed those camp materials really um, with your assistance across the board and highlight some of our um, newest products and campaign um, partner spotlights. Um, we'll bring it straight from the field right into uh, each of you. We wanted to have a little bit of a question and answer panel as well, so we can get some further feedback, but also answer some of your good questions. And then talk a little bit about National Prevention Week info. You've heard a little bit of a teaser with, from Tom and others today. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then lastly, we want to give you the world premiere of the latest um, Talk Day Hear You PSA. Now, if we could just go ahead and take a little bit of time here to sort of walk through our timeline. As we'd mentioned earlier, Talk to Hear You started in 2013. It really was a campaign designed initially just for parents and caregivers. We will, of course, always support our parents and caregivers and never stray away from that as they're a vitally important group for us in addressing and reducing underage drinking. But over the years, you've provided us feedback and asked us for more work. And so with that, we continue to develop materials and messages for both schools and educators to empower the educator's role in reducing and preventing youth and, and substance use. And then most recently, we've expanded our messaging and materials to recognize the role and importance of our community members, to highlight that importance in a way 
that really brings in the whole community and the role that they play in the lives of our children every day. Now, Talk to Harry was built for and by you. Through all of your input and feedback throughout the years, we've been able to develop and disseminate hundreds of products to help parents, caregivers, educators, community members really get informed, be prepared, and take action. The goal has been really to align our public health messaging with the interventions of policy, programs, and practice um, that will help us really continue to meet our goals each year. This 10-year anniversary really is a celebration of everyone's work. It's a celebration of you, all of your contributions, our community partners, organizations, and all of the other people in the field who do great work each and every day to support our children. So let's walk through some of the Talk Day Hear You products if we can. So um, over the years, as we think about this, so we've created a number of fact sheets. These fact sheets really run the span um, to really help you get started with these conversations, to develop uh, strategies. Many parents tell us that they're sometimes a little uncomfortable having that and need some support. We've also created a number of brochures um, that cover topics such as alcohol, marijuana, vaping, opioids. All of these have come through you. And in fact, in many cases, through separate funding to address the other substances. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had some for teens and both for children as well. Now we've created 34 print PSAs um, in a variety of different sizes. It really comes out to about 136 different versions of things. They span all three audiences, both caregivers, educators, and community members. Each PSA offers a short effective message on the importance of preventing um, and having these conversations regularly and often. I often refer to it as the 61 minute conversations, if you will. Now, on our television broadcast PSAs, for which you'll get an opportunity to see another one today, these PSAs offer sim similar messaging as our print uh, PSAs, but it's in a video format so that you can play them in your local theaters or other locations. They're played th throughout our national broadcast um, in 25 designated markets across the United States. Each was produced and written by our team, and as with the print PSAs, they also span all three audiences. So let me just do a little bit by the numbers here, if we can. Chelsea, if you could advance, thank you. So here's some high-level met metrics that you might want to think about that have happened over the last 10 years. So we've been able to grow the campaign to more than 15 licensed partners. We really can't wait till we have 2,000. Um, and so we're, we're going to encourage each and every one of you to sort of help us recruit. We'd like to see can't talk they hear you everywhere we possibly can. But what this also means um, is that at least that many organizations across the country are really utilizing the campaign and its materials for its prevention efforts. And since the launch of the campaign, all of our PSAs really have garnered um, nearly 22 billion uh, impressions. If you think about that for a minute, that is a very large number. Most campaigns rarely reach that kind of number. We also collect an amazing amount of data and everything from clicks and downloads to how we're interacting and using the mobile app, um, really to help us track the, the campaign's viability um, and how well and how effective we are at really engaging our audience. So thank you for your continued support. We look forward to um, uh, really uh, engaging each and every one of you um, in, in the work in that way. So um, we're, uh, and when we're not really done fully with all of our products at this point. So I want to also introduce a few things that are very specific to some of our key audiences. So parents night out. So we might recall we all went through the COVID pandemic. Um, some might say we're still experiencing some pieces of that. But one of the things that came out of that was our parents' night out. Now, this is an educational session that informs parents and caregivers about the realities of underage drinking and other substance use. It's also designed to prepare them on how to have that conversation and how to really address tough issues and help motivate them to really have the conversations. Now, you can do this in one of two ways. You can do this virtually in a one-hour version, or you could do this in a three-session version of this that's in person. Um, the next um, uh, pivot point for us was really to our colleagues in education. 
student assistance materials really related to help guide um, uh, schools and school officials uh, into why they might want to invest in and deploy student assistance programs across in their schools. The Student Assistance Guide for Administrators is really designed to provide school leaders and administrators with key information regarding student assistance services uh, for substance use and mental health initiatives. There's a, an accompanying webinar series that is based around the guide that highlights effective SAP in, implementation and showcases um, actually many states, but two states in particular that are doing very exceptional work there. Now, lastly, uh, and I say lastly, not quite, um, but the, the next thing that I'm very excited to uh, introduce is what parents are saying. This is our podcast. Um, it's really oriented around prevention wisdom, authenticity, and the empowerment of parents. The podcast uh, is with parents, caregivers, and several nationally recognized experts who lend their unique perspectives and experiences in navigating these conversations to really give you an up-close and personal um, uh, discussion and view of that. Now, our uh, free mobile app, the Talk They Hear You campaign mobile app, is also designed to help parents and caregivers really practice for one of the most important conversations that they may ever have with their children. Included in the app is a section to sort of record yourself and practice, view different scenarios and examples, a lot of different information to help you really get informed on how you want to do that. Um, and then um, also a screening tool, which is our latest offering in that. We're, uh, it's called Screen for Success. It is a user-friendly screening tool. I sometimes refer to it as the panic button when things aren't going quite right. It allows a parent or caregiver really to um, take a, a, a look for signs of elevated risk with their young person around health, wellness, and well-being. Screen for Success helps concerned parents and caregivers really better understand the nature of the health, wellness, and well-being of their child and to find local resources um, as well as national resources. So you can find that in our Screen for Success app. There's so much more we could say about all of our products. We often joke routinely that, you know, easy, any one of the product lines could be a presentation all on its own. Um, so please go to the materials uh, tab in the uh, uh, event today in the chat box, and you'll find all of these resources um, focused for you. Now, I did talk a little bit about um, our mobile app. Um, we are nearly 15,000 downloads. But what I really want to do today is I want to introduce you to our host of the Talk to Hear You, What Parents Are Saying um, podcast, Debbie Burnt. And Debbie, if I can um, introduce you um, and have you uh, uh, come on and join us, that would be great. Um, Thank you, Rob. Um, it's so nice to be here today with the Talk They Hear You team. It has been a privilege and an honor to get to host the podcast that started about a year and a half ago. And for those who aren't familiar, we uh, download or, or produce an episode about once a month. And as Rob said, the official title is Talk They Hear You, What Parents Are Saying, Prevention Wisdom, Authenticity, and Empowerment. This podcast format gives us the opportunity to drill down a little deeper into what parents are actually doing and actually saying. Parenting around drugs and alcohol is just hard, and it leaves many of us on shaky ground, not completely sure about our own feelings or if our kids are aware or interested in substance use. So we get to hear what's working and what isn't in efforts to help our kids navigate away from drugs and alcohol. We hope you will listen to all the episodes. And if you do, know that we do want your feedback. Let us know if you have any suggestions for topics or guests or improvements of any kind. But today, I also get to share with you the two latest episodes that are coming out. The first one is a conversation with the Kennedys. Former Congressman Patrick Kennedy and his amazing wife, Amy, spent an hour with us sharing real insights about raising five children. They also both work at a national level in on, around this conversation of mental health and addiction. Mr. Kennedy is actually in long-term recovery and they both have experience with family history. Their insights into the topics we cover, parenting and, subs and underage substance use, are profound. 
and they were so generous with their time. This episode should be out this week, but here's a quick clip from it. The future, because we're not just parents to our own kids. We're parents to other kids because we're all in this together as Americans. We need to protect our kids. Never have we seen the expansion of anxiety and depression and addiction taking more young people's lives ever in the history of this country than what we're seeing today. That's why I'm so grateful to you to put this podcast together so that all parents can know that we've got a big challenge on our hands and we have to fight it at every level. So it was just really an amazing conversation. So keep an eye out for this episode. Um, in fact, if you have a favorite podcast service, just subscribe to our channel. Uh, what Parents Are Saying is available on all podcast cast services. And as you know, if you're subscribed, you'll get alerts when the new episodes are out. But if that wasn't enough, last Friday, we went live with a compilation episode where we speak with seven of our Talk They Hear You Spotlight partners. These are community organizations that are using the Talk They Hear You campaign in truly dynamic ways. Our partners, including all of you, are that who are out there championing, who are the champions of prevention efforts in your communities and beyond, are truly the heartbeat of the campaign. Today, in recognition of National Parent Prevent, National Prevention Week, and to mark the 10th anniversary of the Talk They Hear You campaign, we are lucky to have three of these partners with us live. So first, Beth Zitlo de Jesus from the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board in Cuyahoga County, which is in Ohio, will kick us off. The Adams Board contracts with many more than 70 actually organizations that are doing prevention work in the field and using the Talk They Hear You campaign in ways that have resulted to just under 16 million messaging impressions. Then secondly, we will hear from the Sacramento County Coalition for Youth, which is in California. This group comes out of the Prevention and Early Intervention Department in Sacramento County, and they started with the goal of having young people at the table to help develop prevention strategies that are responsive to, that are responsive to youth needs. The Sacramento Ambassadors for Change were born out of that goal, and this Youth Ambassador Program is now a large part of that coalition. Joelle Oreck, director of that coalition, will be joined by Briley and Christina, two of their youth ambassadors. Then lastly, uh, we will hear from Alicia Tobin at the Safe Yakima Valley Drug-Free Action Team. That's in Washington State. They work closely with schools to do drug-free and drug prevention work in the community, and that community is about half Hispanic. So we'll get to hear how they use the Talk They Hear You materials successfully with all populations and in multiple languages. So as you listen to our three groups, please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A. And now, Beth, take it away for us. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, thanks to everyone who's here today, too. This is um, such an incredible experience. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about who the Adams Board is first, um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, the campaign. Um, so the Adams Board is one of 50 boards across the state of Ohio that is responsible for planning, funding, and overseeing public mental health prevention, treatment, recovery support services, and they're localized to reach each resident and the needs of each group of residents in their areas. Cuyahoga County is urban. We have an urban center, which is Cleveland, Ohio. I'm sure many of you have heard about it, sometimes at the butt of a joke, and other times all the wonderful things here, like the Rock Hall. Um, anyway, here we have a very diverse culture. In Cleveland alone, there's over 120 ethnicities. So, um, in this campaign, we wanted to do a bunch of outreach and public education um, about substance use disorders so that parents could understand how to talk to their children. We didn't want to start from scratch. We wanted to use a campaign that was evidence-based, and we worked it into our four-phase substance use disorder campaign. Phase one was prevention, and we used this campaign. We launched it during National Prevention Week last year. Um, phase two was connection to create 
to treatment. We actually got to launch that one with the rollout of 988, which was pretty cool too. Um, so shout out to uh, you know SAMHSA for making these resources available. Uh, and then phase three was to reduce stigma in our community. And phase four, we had to wrap up by celebrating recovery. Um, prevention is the key for us to get our numbers down as we continue on in this opioid epidemic, as we continue on in seeing our substance use number treatment, our substance use treatment numbers rise. Um, and so that is why we chose this campaign. Here are some samples of the um, campaign materials that we did. It was a very broad campaign. We used billboards, we used our transit system um, for ex interior and exterior advertising. We did streaming ads, radio ads, digital ads, interactive digital ads, um, and a ton of print ads with a, a bunch of our neighborhood newspapers as well as some of our much larger newspapers. <clears throat> this is just a sample of some of the places where we promoted this advertising for this campaign. Um, the, some of the cool things that we did are with our local news stations, um, like for Fox 8, when we ran a commercial with them, they also let us do a story and come on and talk about it on some other segments. So we had a lot of value added there in our campaign. Um, we were able to reach a lot of people with this campaign uh, over by now. So we talked about the statistics or the numbers in those um, first three months when this campaign originally ran. But now we're over 26 million impressions as of a result of this campaign, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> um, when we launched our campaign in Cuyahoga County, it unfortunately was timed with the overdose incident that happened at the Ohio State University, where two college students um, thought they were taking Adderall uh, during finals week and it ended up having fentanyl in it. There was a lot of coverage because one of the students was from Northeast Ohio and um, one of one of the um, reporters showcased our campaign talking about how important it is to reach out, particularly to college students. They're heading out on their own. They're finding their way, um, but not to, to discount them. We talk a lot about talking to youth and teens, and we want you to do that too, right? We're talking about that here. Sometimes we forget that we want to talk to our college kids as they're heading off too um, out of high school. So you can see the quote here, and if we want to just run this video clip, this is just a portion of the story. It all comes at a time when throughout Northeast Ohio, billboards like these keep popping up, urging parents to have conversations with their kids about the changing landscape of drugs and alcohol. No one is exempt. This. Fentanyl laced in drugs for anxiety, focus, or pain is not what Scott Osicki is used to seeing. He serves as CEO of the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County and says there's a recent rise in drugs made to tap into a market beyond those addicted to opiates. The differences are nearly uh, undetectable, even for law enforcement and some medical personnel as well. As well. And uh, we've seen fentanyl in Adderall, Percocet, Xanax, and other counterfeit prescriptions. In Cuyahoga County, statistics from the Board of Health show a decline in drug deaths from heroin over the years, but a rise in fentanyl, which is up to 50 times stronger than heroin. So they're doing it because it's basically cheap. Uh, they can cut other drugs with it, and they also, for some of it, it's also getting people hooked onto fentanyl or to other drugs as well. But it is very dangerous. It's very dangerous, and that's why we want people to know. While police continue to investigate what happened to Tiffany Eiler and two other Ohio State students, Osicki says his team will continue to raise awareness here in Northeast Ohio, reaching out in all sorts of ways to help prevent overdoses. It could just be one time that you take this. It's so dangerous that you could you could die from an overdose. In Cleveland, Clay Lepard, News 5. And Adam's office. Great, thanks so much for sharing that video. Um, very heartbreaking that that launched at the same time as our campaign, but it really did strike a chord with parents about the importance of, of educating our, our young people. Um, and then this is just some results of our, our campaign that went out. Uh, we had a really strong outreach. Um, we had 
lots of schools. We are in 84 different school districts and they came to us and asked for materials. So we were able to provide the licensed materials in our schools. Um, and we had a web page that we launched specifically on our page as a landing site where people could download and share the materials in our local um, system of care. And so that's what we did in it. And it was a really successful campaign. Um, I wanna lay, thank my um, CEO for allowing us to do this uh, and SAMHSA for letting us license the campaign and pushing it out. Um, what was most meaningful to me about us using this campaign is the feedback that we got from residents when we were out and about, when people were like, those tips made it so easy to put into words what we wanna talk to our kids about. And we didn't know how to do that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, hearing that feedback know, makes you know that you're making an impact in the community and that is what I'm so grateful for. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Beth. That is amazing work that you're doing in the community and, and such impressive statistics. Um, we now welcome uh, Joelle Oreck with the Sacramento County Coalition for Youth, along with Briley and Christina from the Sacramento Ambassadors for Change. They come to us from California. Well, good morning. Thanks, Demi. Well, good morning from California. <laughs> um, I'm Joelle Oreck, and I'm the coordinator of the Sacramento County Coalition for Youth. Um, just a little bit of history of us. We began our coalition in 2015 um, to provide an opportunity for community members to get involved in prevention efforts in Sacramento County. Um, Sacramento County's Behavioral Health Services um, uh, felt that that was a really important move. We don't have a lot of prevention providers funded by the county and really looked at how can we involve others in our prevention work and prevention voice in the community. Um, the Sacramento County Office of Education was the successful applicant for, to build the coalition. Um, our first year was an action planning year. Um, so the coalition would create a guide, if you will, to follow specific and effective prevention strategies. And so new members wouldn't come in and join and say, hey, I have a great idea and potentially derail the, the outcome focused uh, focus of our work. Um, our action plan guides our efforts in four areas, environmental prevention strategies, looking at creating community change in the areas of media messaging, which is very important these days, um, youth access, to substances, social or community norms, and looking at laws and policies, either existing or needed. Our coalition meets monthly um, since COVID, um, mostly virtual, to provide an ease of an engagement for both young people and community members. And our coalition includes youth and parents and prevention providers, educators, law enforcement, community-based organizations, and other community members. Um, initially, like I uh, mentioned, our focus for our coalition was to reduce underage drinking. Um, our strategic prevention plan in the county identified alcohol as our primary substance of abuse by young people. Um, since the legalization of recreational marijuana, though, um, we've added um, other substances. So overall, our goals of our coalition are to reduce youth substance use. Hi, I'm Riley Meyer. I'm part of the Sacramento Ambassadors for Change, or SAC for short. And the Sacramento Ambassadors for Change are a group of young people who work with the coalition, like Joelle had said. We wanted to make sure that youth had our own space. And with this, we were able to make sure that they were more comfortable and just easier to have those conversations. All right, hi guys, my name is Christina Alonso. I'm also part of SAC and SECY. Um, at the start of each year, our coalition hosts a youth listening circle, which consists of all youth from Sacramento County, um, from different backgrounds and experiences in their communities. Um, what is great is that youth are invited to this space to kind of just talk about what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what they're hearing about youth substance use. Um, and this actually helps our coalition um, use information from this listening circle to guide our work for the rest of the year. One of the primary things that we hear from youth um, every year is that parents need to be educated on youth substance use and substances because they are different now than what they were when our parents were younger. So as I mentioned at the beginning, our first during our first year of action planning, um, we had young people at the table when we were creating how the coalition would work. And um, what they continually said to us 
is nothing about us without us. And so we always wanted to make sure that our young people were at the table, which is why we host, like Christina said, our youth listening circle each year. Um, so our coalition listens. And when we heard what our youth said, um, that that it's really important and that they really understand what the influence, the influence that parents have. Um, so we went to look for resources um, to provide outreach and education for parents. And we found Talk to Hear You. Um, uh, similar to Beth, we were looking for something that was evidence-based that mattered to us. And so uh, Talk to Hear You was exactly what we needed. Um, so we began the launch in 2016. Um, we held a press event at the Sacramento Zoo, um, which was a family-friendly location. Um, we worked together with our County Board of Supervisors to designate and proclaim April 6th, which was the day of our press event as Talk to Hear You Day in Sacramento County. Um, we worked with a local PR firm and parents on our coalition to provide media and messaging directly for parents by parents. Um, we created presentations to highlight the materials and presented to community groups, school PTSAs at health fairs and other community events. Um, and then we launched the media campaign. Media, media, media is what we said. How much, how, how much can we get out in the community? We, we, our hope was that parents would go to a presentation, they would get some of our materials, and then they would see the media, and it would be as a, a, a kind of constant reminder for them um, to have those conversations with their young people. Um, we created billboards, um, bus signage, transit shelter signage. Um, we did articles in local magazines and newspapers. Um, and then we shared our PSAs in movie theaters and on radio stations and on TV. Um, so we'd like to share one of our um, PSAs with you. And um, just fun fact, we were able to share this PSA um, at all the Sacramento Kings NBA home playoff games this year. So that was really exciting. Just any way, creative way we can to get the information out. With my son, who's a he's an athlete, he plays a lot of sports. So he and I talk about nutrition. How do you stay fueled up so that you have enough energy to play well? Wear sunscreen when you go out. But one of the things that we now also talk about is underage drinking. And it's become that norm of these things of how do you take care of yourself? You wear sunscreen, you eat well, um, you stay away from drinking, and it's because it's going to impact you as an athlete too. So I just give a tip also in really thinking about what, is your, what does your son or daughter care about? And finding a way to link that to that conversation, even when you feel uncomfortable, and the more you talk about it, the more normal it becomes, and the easier it is to have that conversation. Talk. They hear you. Okay, so after the pandemic hit, we needed a fresh new way to share our ideas. Like Joella said, we created PSAs, billboards, and other materials, but since everyone was put on lockdown, we needed a way for them to physically see our message. Now, we wanted to continue showing the importance of our message and possibly using this time to build more communication and connection with parents and caregivers with their youth. And that's how we came to our family meal kits. Now, included in the family meal kit, we have a talk it up game, which you can see on the top left corner. And this is just kind of a group of conversation starters, like icebreaker type questions. Next, we have our campaign placemat, which is just an explanation of the Talk They Hear You campaign that is shown at the bottom. Then we, can, we also include an SCCY cup and an information place card with just some, some facts just so parents can understand the information that they should be giving to their youth. And that is at the top right corner. Now, these meal kits come in six different languages, Spanish, Hmong, Farsi, Arabic, and Russian. Yeah, and as Riley said, during the pandemic, it was challenging to get our message out. So the big question was, how do we get these out during this time? Um, our coalition started with handing these uh, family meal kits out to families during drive through meal pickups. So during the pandemic, our community had like little meal pickups that they can hand out. So we thought, well, perfect timing to give this out as well. Um, we also have found some creative ways coming out of the pandemic to hand family meal kits out. So like we go to schools, health fairs, community events, um, boys and girls clubs. We also, like Joel said, we hand them out at the Kings game too sometimes, which is really cool to kind of get it to that 
broader audience in Sacramento. And we also have a triple A baseball team here in Sacramento known as the River Cats, and we hand them out at their games as well. And these are a few examples of families picking them up at the River Cats games, and they're actually holding it in their hands, which is super cute. Those kids are so cute. <laughs> Oh, here's a few more pictures <laughs> that were supposed to be in the game. But yeah, some examples of the Boys and Girls Club on the top left. On the right, we have um, Slamson, the Kings um, mascot holding it. And then on the uh, bottom right is the River Cats mascot holding one of ours as well. Here. In our first year, go ahead. I was just going to say, in our first, in the first year, we had just about four um, million impressions, and um, we continue to um, get those materials out and um, and build those numbers and provide those resources for families. Thank you, Thank you gals, so much. The work in Sacramento has been really impressive. Love all these creative ideas. Um, so now let me welcome Alicia Tobin from the Safe Yakima Valley Drug-Free Action Team in Washington State. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having Safe Yakima here today. And thank you to all of our partners in prevention for joining us today. The work you do is so appreciated. Um, so a little bit about Safe Yakima. We've been around since 2006. Um, we kind of wear two hats in the community. We, of course, have our drug-free coalition, the uh, Drug-Free Action Team, which does amazing work. And then we also have a youth mentoring program uh, where we take elevated risk youth who have been um, exposed to opioid addiction, either themselves or family members. Um, and the schools identify them either by truancy issues, grade issues, um, for a variety of behavioral issues. And then we work with them. We find a uh, members in the community to volunteer with them four hours a month um, to mentor them, to provide that steady, constant, caring adult in their life. And then we integrate some of the tools from uh, our drug-free action team into that, um, including the Talk They Hear You campaign. So a little bit about Yakima Valley. Uh, we are a very rural community. Um, as Robert can attest to being from the Pacific Northwest, uh, agricultural based, our county population is 256,000. Um, we are actually geographically the second largest county in the state at uh, 4,300 square miles. So we're very widespread out. Uh, the demographics of our county are 50.2% Latino. Uh, ages 18 to 64 run just under 50% at 48.7. And ages 6 to 17, which is SAFE's target age group, is 29.5%. Uh, so how did I get exposed to Talk They Hear You and why Talk They Hear You? So I actually come from 26 years of banking. Um, I retired from banking last May. And uh, the reason I did so is my boys are 25 and 24. Uh, they lost friends to fentanyl overdose. Uh, I was one of those parents to the kids, as uh, Senator Kennedy talked about. A lot of the kids congregated at our house. Um, and when they didn't have the conversations with their parents, I had those conversations. But unfortunately, we had several kids uh, in the boys' circle that either went to rehab or lost their lives. And so when my boys graduated college, I said to my husband, I really want to do uh, prevention work on a full-time basis because I was volunteering in the community at the time. And so in May of last year, I retired from banking and just dove in. Um, so I've literally just been in my role one year. And a few weeks after I jumped in, somebody said, hey, you should go to mid-year in Orlando. And I said, okay, booked a flight. Flew to Orlando, had no idea what I was doing, but just kept drinking from the fire hose. And I walked by a booth that had the talk to hear you information and said, well, this seems interesting. And believe it or not, I attended one of uh, Robert's breakout sessions. Uh, and it was very important for me coming with a business background, obviously in business, particularly if you don't produce results, 
that's all that matters, right? And so it was very important for me that we based everything on uh, evidence-based programs. Um, and one of the things we talked about in the podcast that I did is I was mesmerized by people who had been in the industry many, many, many more years than me locally who, who were still using um, fear tactics, uh, motivational speakers, different things that were proven to not be evidence-based. And so even more so wanted to make sure that we were countering that with evidence-based. Um, and so with Talk to Hear You, uh, why did we go that route? Well, it has a proven track record, as you guys obviously already know, um, and it is evidence-based. Parents and caregivers are the most influ influential factor in youth substance use prevention. And so getting them, we're building the skill sets and the drug resistant skills with life skills training, but we also need to build up the parent skills and having those conversations. And as common sense as it appears, many parents in the community said they didn't know how to approach it. Do they have really long drawn out lectures with their kids? Um, how do they, when, and how do they have these conversations? And so we, we learned quickly that parents needed to develop the skill and become a protective factor. Um, the toolkit is extremely easy to use. Um, several resources and media tools available. And what was important, obviously, for our community is that these resources were available in English and in Spanish. So some of the things that we did um, as a marketing major, it was very important for me to have the layering effect. And what that means is in marketing, you should have a minimum three different media in order to penetrate um, the message overload that consumers experience. And so we use some of the prepackaged media, uh, which is a huge time saver for us. We actually, shortly after I started my role, I lost my um, coalition um, employee coordinator. And so I had to do all the coordination in addition to running the mentoring program uh, with my mentoring coordinator. And so having that prepackaged media was super simple, just adding our logo on there um, and having them ready to go and plugging them into a calendar. Um, we actually tie all the messaging in similar to what they do with the prepackaged media to national prevention campaigns. So for example, in February, when it was Marijuana Prevention Month, we of course used the prepackaged marijuana prevention or having conversations about that. Um, we had PSAs in English and Spanish about uh, marijuana prevention, and then we launched uh, our billboard campaign. So these are some of the examples uh, of our posts. Public service announcement. So one thing that we discovered um, is that Spanish has a lot more words in it than English. So when we would go to translate the English PSA into Spanish, we would run over our 30 seconds um, by quite a bit. And so one of the Spanish radio stations, fortunately, has a template they use where they have a certain font size and we're able to go in and type the English message. And once we got to 10 lines of that font, we knew we were at 30 seconds. And so then we had to kind of massage the message a little bit and remove content. Um, and there was a little bit of art to that because we didn't obviously want to take away uh, from the message. Um, and so then we would work together on that. And we had to do the same thing with the billboards because it became very wordy. And as you know, you only have a matter of seven seconds to capture someone's attention with a billboard. Um, and so we had to go in and massage that. We also wanted to make sure that the images on the billboard matched the audience. So a lot of the images for the billboards were Caucasian families or African-American families. And we have a very minute African-American population in Yakima. And since the Latino population was about 50%, we worked with the SAMHSA team to identify a few photos where family members were sitting at the dinner table because that is a prime time for Latino families to get together. Um, and we use that image in our billboard. Um, but here are an English version as well as a Spanish version of our PSA. We all make choices about alcohol. Kids make choices whether to drink or not. Bye, Dad. Remember, I'm going to Alex's party tonight and sleeping over. Hey, uh, remind me about that party again. And adults make choices whether to talk about it. 
That's true of parents and every other trusted adult in a kid's life. Kids want to know our expectations, and they want honest answers in everyday conversations. So talk with your kids and help lead them on a positive path. Because when you talk, they hear you. Learn more at underagedrinking.samsa.gov. Brought to you by Safe Yakima Valley. Todos tomamos decisiones sobre el alcohol y nuestros hijos deciden beber o no. Adiós, papá. Recuerda que esta noche me voy a la fiesta de Ana y allá me voy a quedar a dormir. Oye, a ver, a ver, a ver, recuérdame otra vez de esa fiesta. Y los adultos deciden hablar de ello. Nuestros niños quieren saber nuestras expectativas y quieren respuestas honestas. Así que hable con sus hijos y llévelos por un camino positivo. Porque cuando hablas, te escuchan. Aprenda más en androidsdrinking.samsha.gov Brought to you by Save Yakima Valley. So those were the same ad in English and Spanish. Um, we also changed the name in the Spanish ad to be more of a, a Latino name than um, a Caucasian name. Again, trying to just resonate with that audience. Um, and like Beth, we had a tremendous amount of feedback from community members saying, gosh, we didn't realize it was so simple, that it really isn't that hard. It doesn't have to be long lectures. They can be quick conversations on the way to school, on the way to practice at the dinner table. Um, so it was a lot of fun to get that kind of feedback. And we had three different PSAs in the month of uh, February. We ran the marijuana prevention ad. Then in March, um, we did alcohol awareness. And then we also tying into April, we carried the alcohol awareness and alcohol awareness month. And then we did one about substance use in general to tie into the drug take back event. Um, for the month of April, at the end of April. Some of the other media that we used, again, with that layering effect, uh, we have found that five conversation goals is a tremendous effect. That flyer in particular is probably our favorite. Um, we bring it to any kind of event, whether it's at school. Um, we had a hidden in plain sight event with another coalition in town. And so we printed them and co-branded them and gave it to them to hand out at their event. Um, we also, on our website, added links to Talk They Hear You on our Drug Free Action Team page on our website so that, again, parents have that as a resource. We also have some of our uh, radio interviews that we did, which is the final bullet. So as a result of buying these PSAs, uh, radio stations were actually having us come on and talking about the subject. We got a good 10 to 15 minutes. Um, once in February, once in March, and one in, once in April to talk about the campaign. And uh, they just completely were bought in uh, on teaching the community about the Talk They Hear You campaign. So successes, uh, we really had a minimal Facebook reach. And so we went from 100 a month to 4,000 a month in just four months. Uh, billboard reach is over 70,000 a week um, per billboard. Uh, radio reach is over 50,000 a month um, in the English and the Spanish. And our word of mouth recognition increased dramatically. Uh, and again, the takeaways, layering is key. And the, as a marketer, I can't emphasize enough. When somebody is exposed to a message only once, they don't even know the message is there. The second time, they maybe recognize it, but don't really pay attention to it. And so it's a minimum three times before they finally pause and they realize there may be something that they need to quote unquote purchase. Um, and the ideal time exposure is seven times. Um, tie the messaging to national prevention themes and you'll get a lot of that layering. Familiarize yourself with the toolkit and don't wait for tomorrow, start today. That was fantastic, Alicia. Thank you so very much for sharing all of that. So we have some questions and would love to bring all of our um, groups onto the screen. And the, one of the first questions we have is about funding. You know, how did you find funding and how do you make that work inside the community? And any of you can start. Beth, do you wanna start? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so we are governed by an 18 member board and we take all funding decisions through our board. Um, the majority of our funding comes from Cuyahoga County's Health and Human Services Levy. Um, we, as I mentioned, and you saw some of the statistics in that news story, um, are in the midst of a fentanyl 
overdose crisis here in Cuyahoga County. And we wanted people not just to know what to do in that crisis and not just hear the doom and gloom about fentanyl. So we proposed the entire four phase campaign to our board um, and that's how we got the approval for that. So we had about $1.2 million in campaign funds available to us to do um, uh, for 2022 and we chose to push it forward for that. Our board was happy to hop on and when they saw the results, they were just stunned. Um, we saw increased requests for community fairs. We saw increased requests um, for referral to services and prevention information in local communities. So those were some indirect um, benefits of the funding that our board was happy to stand beside uh, behind when they see results like that. It's amazing. You, you do bring up an important point is tying to outcomes and tying to results. Um, uh, Joelle, any other thoughts about funding? Yeah, we um, when we first launched the campaign, it kind of it, a little bit of a perfect storm where we were um, uh, a, a, along with other prevention providers were a recipient of a, a large funding source from um, our Department of Healthcare Services. They had some extra prevention dollars, and we put in a bid to to get some of those dollars along with other prevention providers in Sacramento County. Um, and we were successful. And so um, that was really helpful because media, as you all know, is expensive. And so we were really able to launch some strong media that way. Um, and then, um, as we mentioned, when we did our refresh during the pandemic, um, uh, we had COVID re relief dollars, um, some ARPA and CURSA dollars from the federal government that we had access to as well. And so we're able to continually to launch the campaign that way um, and have built some great relationships with other coalitions um, and some of our media partners. So um, we're hoping to leverage some of those relationships when we don't have as many um, dollars available. Very, very smart. Um, Alicia, any thoughts about funding in Washington Our State? funding sources are completely different. We didn't have any state dollars. Uh, we got funds from DFC, um, again, because it's evidence-based. So when you're looking at those federal dollars, it's critical that it's evidence-based. And then, um, unfortunately, Yakima has the distinguished uh, area of being a high-intensity drug trafficking area. So there's HIDA monies that are available and a big portion of our HIDA grant we specifically built around that. In fact, I wrote the grant while I was sitting in my hotel in Orlando during mid-year. It was like, talk about baptism by fire. Uh, and so was building that in there. Um, and then through our coalition, we have a media person on our coalition. And he was the one that was critical to getting us that FaceTime um, for free to sit for 10 to 15 minutes uh, in the radio station and get that extra promotional material. And I would say, if you're a nonprofit, ask. Um, some say we don't have the ability to do any kind of matching, but with uh, one of the, the English providing radio station was able to give us additional airtime simply because we are a nonprofit and they posted our material on their website um, for free. That's brilliant. Um, there's there's so much creativity in every aspect of this. We, we just really are so impressed. Um, let me switch and ask Rob a question. Um, it's more of a campaign type general question. We have a question from Cielo Alvarez uh, Suarez, who is a TEAP specialist in Phoenix Job Corps Center. Um, the question is, I work in alcohol and drug issues with students, and I wonder if there are any efforts from SAMHSA to incorporate for prevention in substance use in all schools. Increasing the number of students uh, in the you, that use substances is alarming, according to what I see in our uh, center. In a group of 10 new students admitted, eight are drug testing positive at entrance, and this is only an example. So thanks, Debbie, for that. And, and um, to the question being asked, so the short answer is yes, we have. Um, so the campaign, you might have heard us talk a little bit about parents and caregivers, schools and educators and community. And this year we're focused on community, but that does not mean we've forgotten about our educator folks. Um, so we have a whole series on student assistance. I'm a big advocate for student assistance. My particular belief, whether it's a school-based mental health, health services, or traditional student assistance program, every school should have such. 
Um, it does a lot of what you're talking about in terms of early engagement and looking for the elevated risk. Now, that being said, we have created um, the administrator's guide, which you could use, but also there's a series of PowerPoints and other things that are useful that way as well. Um, screen for success, and I didn't speak to this very uh, much uh, in the broader aspect of that, but there is a version coming available of Screen for Success that is designed very specifically for organizations, in particular schools, um, as we're working with a number of schools to, to do that. And in large part, it says, you heard me refer to it sort of fondly as the panic button, but when you're working with a child and all of a sudden it feels a little bit more than a, converse, a brief conversation is going to do it, and then I have some um, deeper concerns about what might be happening, but can't quite quantify it just yet. That's the whole idea around Screen for Success. This is free. You can use it even as it is right now, even though it, we've got it, I'm going to refer to it as the individual use case, but you can use it as part of the mobile app, and you can use it in that front, or you can go to screenforsuccess.org. Um, so there will be more products coming out going forward in that frame, um, as well as there's a few new curriculums that are in the pipeline. One is motivational interviewing for parents and caregivers. You could use that through the school to help build those parents up and help um, do that. You could also do parents night out in the schools coming from Job Corps. That would be a perfect given your audience. But we're also developing a motivational interviewing for student assistance professionals and administrators. And that really is to help our school administrators and other professionals in the school sort of stay away from, I think, a little bit of what Alicia talked about, some of those older, highly confrontational conversations. What we're trying to do is motivate young people when we're concerned about their health, wellness, and well-being to either find care or to intervene early so that we can get them either the support or the care that they may need. And with that, you know, I'll, I'll turn it back to Debbie, but, you know, we uh, are always looking for suggestions. So let me just say this. If there is a thought that you have, or frankly, anybody on any of our products, please do share. This campaign, as I said earlier, is built for and by you. And so, you know, our efforts really are developing the materials. We look to our partners on all of the implementation and all the creative ways that they do that. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let me switch gears and ask Sacramento. We had a question, who is leading the youth listening circles, youth or adults? And then I would add to that this idea that these circles produce comments from kids that our parents need education. It's really kind of a remarkable one. So talk to us a little bit about both of those things and what you've done with it. Um, I would say our, for our youth listening circles, there is an adult ally in the room who starts the question or proposes the questions that are set for the youth to answer, but it's honestly youth-led, like they start the conversations with each other and they go and they talk about their experiences and kind of just go around a circle either kind of comparing experiences like, oh yeah, I see that too in my communities and build on top of that. So it's just the proposed question from an adult allies, but the youth definitely drive that conversation through. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And then when they when the youth um, present to the larger coalition after they, they do, we do the youth listening circle and then they come in and they present to the larger coalition and that's completely led by the young people. They share their answers and they share. Um, and part of that process is our coalition members, the adults in our coalition are not allowed to speak during that time because we just don't want that um, any kind of takeover there. We want to really hear what they have to say. So um, so we have some we have some good Good guidelines for the adults in the room. <laughs> That's amazing. And so tell me a little bit about what you've done with that, with those directives from young people that their parents need education. I mean, I just find that so surprising. In some way, our kids are more wise than we are as their parents sometimes. Right, right. You know, it's so funny because when we knew that when you, you know the statistic that, that you know that it's such a high percentage. Of, um, of young people that really care about what their parents think, you know, and I remember here, every time I hear that percentage, I think, well, you know, I'm a parent and I think they don't care what I have to say. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that statistic. And yet 
our young people every time come up with this. And so, um, and then when they, when we brainstorm as a coalition as a whole, and then also when the young people brainstorm, when they're just, you know, when they're just the youth alone without the adults in the room, um, we constantly are looking for, okay, what do we do now? What do we do with that information? And um, this past year, um, they've done several pre presentations to parent groups. Um, some of them are schools. We're based out of the County Office of Education. And so um, we have a lot of great relationships with schools. And so um, just kind of some doors open there where they can present to parents, to PTA, um, or schools that say, we need, we'd love to hear about you know, um, what kind of resources you have available for our parents. And so they go in and share um, information um, that way. Uh, anything else you want to share? I think you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you all for that. Um, Rob, we have a community member who is asking, um, or well, how can community members get involved in urban cities on the East Coast? Who can I speak with and how can community-based organizations get involved? Well, um, myself and the entire team are always happy to assist. So we can just start there. So you can you can start in Chelsea or, or somebody will send an email out with uh, how to get in contact with us. And so we're always happy to assist. We've done that with a number of states over the years. Um, that being said, we will also connect you to some of the other resources that we know of our other uh, partners, such as Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America or CADCA, um, some of the other groups that are in there, as well as some of your state folks. Um, because in each state, there is a National Prevention Network member um, that is charged with doing some of this work. So there's a lot of groups that really are doing this work. Um, and so we are always, uh, because we primarily focus on the development of materials, um, and then partner out and network with everybody else um, gives us a, a really a broad um, cast, if you will, um, to do that. But that being said, um, always reach out and we will do everything in our power in different groups. It could be different federal agencies as well with different initiatives. Um, uh, Alicia had mentioned uh, HIDA and DEA, one of our key partners. So there's a number of groups that really do as well. Uh, let me just first say, Prevention needs to be ubiquitous. And the only way that happens is when we're all rowing together, making sure the messaging, messaging is virtually everywhere we can get it as often as we can get it. And so it, 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 uh, as a point of pride, it really sort of forces all of us to put our, our, our delicate little egos aside for a minute and go, how do I really affect the needle? How do I really help everybody have success? which is not about the me, but about the we. And that really is at the heart of this campaign, it's about the we. Fantastic. Um, let me ask each of our groups, there's some questions about um, how you evaluate the, the campaign. I think we talked a little bit about the need for looking at outcomes and the evaluations. Um, and then any more qualitative comments from parents and the the effect the program has had on them. So let me start with you, Beth. So um, some of the ways that we measured our metrics, we did social listening. Uh, so we used a platform where we schedule all of our social media. That platform that we use allows us to listen to the conversations. So uh, when our social media campaigns were shared, we could see what people were talking about when they were looking at our campaigns. Um, that was positive. So it wasn't just about how many tweets went out, how many posts went up, but really what was the community talking talking about when they saw these, were they resharing them? Were they resharing them with information and what did that um, entail? So um, in that sort of listening, we were listening that. On their streaming sites, we looked mostly at link clicks. So people would click through what they heard, which usually indicated to us that a parent wanted to learn more about how to talk to their kids. Um, and then we would see how long people stayed on our website when they came. Um, so that's like a bounce rate. So would people stay there and look? And they stayed there for a long time. I wish I would have pulled that that um, number, but I did not. Uh, but I think they were staying on our site for an average of two to three minutes, but I'm guessing on that number, um, which is really good. They were looking at the tips and reading the materials. We also used a heat map to see where on that page they were clicking and what they were reading. 
Um, a lot of it was those uh, that conversation tools, um, how to talk to your kids, when to do that. And the, in addition to what we bought, the media buys. So, um, you know, we were looking at the number of impressions that our billboards would get, what would happen on the bus, um, that stuff. So we really dove a lot deeper than I got into on here because this is just an overview. Um, but that's sort of the listening tools that we use to better understand exactly how our outreach helped in our community. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Alicia, did you look at it any differently? Uh, so we did a lot of the similar metrics to Beth. Uh, we did website visits, obviously looking at the clicks. Um, and from a qualitative standpoint, we had a number of community-based organizations reach out to us, uh, newspapers um, and parents that just were like, we never heard of Safe Yakima and we'd been around since 2006. And so it was quite interesting how much more people were like, we didn't know what kind of work we heard, or those that had heard of Safe Yakima were like, we didn't really know what you did. And so it really was informative from the qualitative standpoint the other thing that we just started uh, to implement, and we're going to do it at our Hidden in Plain Sight event at the end of this month, um, we couldn't get it in during National Prevention Weeks, but we got it in at the end of the month at a, a local high school. All the schools will be invited to it. We're going to have a um, questionnaire at the end to say, you know, have you heard of this before? Will you use this? Um, so implementing a, a survey that parents will fill out while some are touring the Hidden in Plain Sight room. Um, so they have something to do to keep them busy, uh, and then we'll evaluate those results. Really creative as well. Um, Joelle, Riley, Christina, anything else about outcomes? Similar, I mean, as, as far as media metrics and stuff, and it's really nice that the media can provide those for you, the dashboards that they get. So we really see um, not only the numbers and the impressions, but um, they can target specific communities or um, communities that have, fam uh, you know, families with young people of a certain age, kids of a certain age. And so that was really targeted um, our media that way. Um, and then also um, similar to what Beth said, we, well, we created a map of our community and where are we doing the majority of our um, outreach and our um, uh, presentations and where do we need to reach out to? Um, and then when we get response from other prevention providers or some of those events, um, that's what drove um, what language is next. What do we want to um, create our family meal kit in what language would be next? Because we have that kind of outreach and they're, they're asking for those resources. Um, and then also <laughs> just some really good, some fun qualitative information when we handed our family meal kits out. Yeah, um, a lot of times when we go out to the communities and we give out our family meal kits, um, for example, we had a River Cats game, we were hitting them out, and a parent actually came back after they had received the cup, came back after, like, later in the game, and was like, that's, like, this game is amazing, like, they kind of gave, like, personal direct feedback about the game afterwards, so that, that kind of means a lot to us, and like, okay, it does reach people, people are using it, it's not just we're handing this out and they're going somewhere else. Yeah, when people make an effort to come back and tell you how great something is, you, you know you've made an impact. That's that's remarkable. Um, let me ask Rob, I, we have a couple questions about engaging with the program or the campaign. Um, is this opportunity an RFP application? And then another question of can we reapply for four more years? Our grant will end next year. So... Talk to Hear You has no RFP. It is always free to each and every one of you. You can send us an email at any time. Once you're licensed, you're licensed in perpetuity until you choose to do something different. Um, so uh, that is the only reason that we ever licensed was really to protect the brand in a way that just like the three coalitions you're hearing from today, that they could feel like they had a trusted source of what they were getting. Um, as it also relates to that, I would also just remind people in the evaluation, you could go to our annual report to Congress and you will see the ongoing evaluation of the campaign published in the report to Congress every year, including all the case studies, the parent focus groups, the exact um, uh, basis for how we come to do everything um, is all there as well as our annual reports um, including some of the case study reports as well. So all of that is there public. Um, you can go to stopalcoholabuse.com 
com, or dot com, dot gov. Sorry about that. <laughs> and um, uh, that will give you all of that information there. So back to you, Debbie. Thank you. So we're getting lots of thank yous from uh, listeners and watchers. And um, thank you for the different populations and, and specifically Alicia and how you're working with uh, so much diversity. Um, you too, Sacramento. And let me just say, is there any last comment from, from each of you? And then we'll hand it back over to Rob. Beth, why don't you start us? I just want to say that um, we know that there is no way that um, we are going to, we can't keep pulling people out of the fire that we're in right now. And prevention is really the way that we are going to remedy um, future generations from being in the same situations we are now. Um, so implementing this campaign, encouraging people to start the conversations early, have them repetitively, not be afraid to talk to their children and have the tools. That's what's going to change what we see in the future. And that's why this campaign is so important. Thank you so much. Alicia? Um, to tag on that, there simply isn't enough intervention work to curb the problem. Obviously, intervention work is, is important, but I really believe especially on a cost per consumer as well, we have got to invest the dollars in prevention work. That's where we're really going to curb curb the numbers. Um, and then for those that maybe think you have to have a social worker background, a psychology degree, um, are a little intimidated by the work, uh, whether you're a community member and you think, oh, I can't do it because I don't have a social background or I don't have a psychology background. Well, I'm a banker. I have a business degree and I could do it. If I can do it, you can do it. So just jump in, as I said, get started today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much. Sacramento, any last thoughts for us? I'll, I'll just start and then I know we all have really one quick thought, but uh, I really liked um, the comment about layering and how important it is to really layer the message. And there's so many great resources with Talk They Hear You that it's really easy to do. And so, um, and also I really um, want to just put out there if anybody's interested in, in the resources that we've um, created, um, you're very welcome to have them. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, but also partnerships, the value of partnerships. And um, I mentioned before, we're from the County Office of Education, and um, we've been working very closely with our student mental health and wellness team, um, who are, their goal is to put a mental health clinician on all the school campuses. And um, those folks are very well versed in mental health, but maybe not so much in prevention. And so really providing these resources for them and some training for them an opportunity for our prevention team and their clinician team to connect and get together um, has been so valuable um, just to really expand all of our reach and all of our knowledge and all of our connection to young people um, and to really um, layer those resources um, and, and engage students in that way. So that's been something that um, has been valuable for us. And I know um, Bradley and Christina have something as well. Um, I just wanted to say from a youth perspective, the Talk They Hear You campaign is so important because sometimes youth don't really understand how much of an impact their parents do have on them. And that communication is really key. Like during some of our health fairs that we've done, we pass out and we make sure we pass out the materials to parents, caregivers, youth, because building these connections now will help them later. And the younger that you give that you start building these conversations, even if it's just simple things, like a simple conversation, how was your day? Just making sure that you can talk with your youth because these connections, the more they build, the more comfortable these youth are gonna be able to have with their parents about these big deal conversations, and especially in the Sacramento County, just there's so much youth substance use that it's so important to just start as soon as you can. So I wanted to say thank you for everything that you guys have done. Yeah, I just want to add, um, I come from, like, the reason why I do this work that I do now as a young person is because I have family history of misuse, of substance misuse, so it's so important, the work that we're doing all here and across the country, Beth, we feel like you guys are so amazing for doing the work that you guys do, so I just want to say thank you guys for, for inviting us to share our experiences and our work. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for being here with us today and celebrating National Prevention Week. And I'd like to hand it back to Rob. 
So let me first say thank you to our youth ambassadors, Christina and Briley. So you are the reason that we all exist. Um, it is to each and every community out there that we titled this soundtrack. And I would just thank our musicians, Aaron Canada and Richie Canada, Liberty DeVito and Julio Fernandez and all the, the men who put and women who put this together um, for our soundtrack, but also the, our creative team. And you're going to get a chance to see the world premiere of This Life for Us. It's also accompanied by a discussion starter and a number of other materials. So with that, let's go ahead and roll tape. Everyone has a community to lean on, a neighborhood, school, kids teams, where you worship, work, work out, or any other place or group where you choose to belong. Communities can provide support when you need it, and even when you don't know you do. Like when it comes to preventing underage drinking and other substance use. You've talked with your kids and shared clear expectations, but you're not with them every minute. Your community members, friends and relatives, teachers and coaches, faith leaders, and other important adults in your kids' lives can be your eyes, ears, and a supportive influence when you're not around, reinforcing your messages with your kids and alerting you to warning signs of underage drinking or other substance use. So talk with your kids about these issues and involve the members of your community to help keep your kids safe, because when you talk, they hear you. For more information, visit talktheyhearyou.samhsa.gov. Well, I am so excited. There is a, an entire suite of materials built simply around this life for us, including the original soundtracks, discussion starter, various versions, um, 30, 15 seconds, et cetera. Um, it is the theme for this year. Um, and then leading us forward to what's next with National Prevention Week. It's just started. Today marks the first day. So we've got Communities That Talk. That's going to happen on Wednesday. Please tune in May 10th, 2 to 3 p.m., uh, Eastern Standard, so for our California folks, our Pacific folks. Um, again, this is going to be panel discussions with, about our communities, um, and they're going to share some of their prevention strategies around the discussions there. Um, also, share on my prevention story, hashtag my prevention story on social media. Tell us what prevention means to you. It's really important that we find our voice collectively and that we make it known. To Alicia, Beth, um, uh, uh, and the, our California team, um, it's really important that we develop um, a sounding board and that we develop um, uh, our voice in a way and find our voice and make sure that it's known if we expect to impact us. Now, don't forget, all week long, you can visit the platform, the virtual platform. You can watch on-demand videos. We've put a number of our things in there, but there are plenty of others. Um, it will also You'll also be able to download the prevention and mental health-themed activities including the bingo card, the word search, and the crossword puzzle, and ad libs, and many, many more things. So with that, I would like to give a big shout out and thank you to all of the Talk to Hear You team and its members uh, and partners. It spans very, it's 22 federal agencies, 1,500 partners plus, um, an entire creative team. Um, and every idea counts. So if you have a new thought or something we could do better or something we could add to, please never hesitate to reach out to us. If you need help in your state and you want us to connect because we know other people, we're happy to connect you to other coalitions who have banded together to either implement or do other things as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, amazing talent, and please uh, be present for our children today. 